Please take your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9 with me this morning. We're going to be reading chapters 9 and 10 both <clears throat> today. Uh, so if you turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to begin our reading there in verse 1. 2 Samuel 9, verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he's in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he said, Here is your servant. David said to him, Do not fear. For I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Then the king called Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. In chapter 10. Now it afterwards appeared that the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanun his son became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent some of his servants to console him concerning his father. But when David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites, the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their lord, do you think that David is honoring your father because he has sent consolers to you? Has David not sent his servants to you in order to search the city, to spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun took David's servants, shaved off half their beards, cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips, and sent them away. When they told it to David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, stay at Jericho until your beards grow, and then return. Now when the sons of Ammon saw that they had become odious to David, the sons of Ammon sent and hired the Arameans of Bethrehob and the Arameans of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Machah with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob with 12,000 men. When David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army, the mighty men. The sons of Ammon came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the city, while the Arameans of Zobah and of Rehob and the men of Tob and Maacah were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him in front and in the rear, he selected from all the choice men of Israel and arrayed them against the Arameans. But the remainder of the people he placed in the hand of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the sons of Ammon. He said... If the Arameans are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come to help you. Be strong. and Let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. 
So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Arameans, and they fled before them. When the sons of Ammon saw that the Arameans fled, they also fled before Abishai and entered the city. Then Joab returned from fighting against the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadad-Ezer sent and brought out the Arameans who were beyond the river. And they came to Helam. And Shobach, the commander of the army of Hadad-Ezer, led them out. Now when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and crossed the Jordan and came to Helam. The Arameans arrayed themselves to meet David and fought against him. But the Arameans fled before Israel. And David killed 700 charioteers of the Arameans, 40,000 horsemen, and struck down Shobach, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings, servants of hadad Ezer, saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Arameans feared to help the sons of Ammon anymore. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. We are in 2 Samuel that we just read a moment ago. If you are new or visiting, we took a break last week for Easter, of course, and we are making our way through this wonderful book. And uh, today we come to these two chapters, chapters 9 and 10. I encourage you to have an open Bible and follow along if you need to get the most out of our study today. <clears throat> when you don't know what to buy someone, a, a safe option these days is a gift card. Everybody loves to get one, especially if it's to your favorite restaurant. When somebody gives you a gift card like that, it's, it's very thoughtful, and you often respond, of course, with, with a word of appreciation. Wow, I didn't, I didn't expect that. Thank you so much. You might send them a note or something, but usually you respond with, with gratitude. But, but imagine that a, a friend of yours is going through a rough patch. And you go to their house to see them, and you don't really know what to say, you don't really know what to do. And so you think, well, maybe a night out, you know, would be helpful, so you, you buy them a gift card. And they can see that it's, it's for a, the, their favorite restaurant, and it's, it's for a very generous amount. But instead of saying thank you, they, they walk over to their kitchen. And they pull out that junk drawer. And, and while looking you in the face, they hold up the gift card and pull out a pair of scissors and cut it. What, what, an, what an ugly response. As if to say, I don't need your pity. I, I don't have time for this. Don't, don't you think I can pay for my own food? Don't you think I can take care of myself? Right? How ungrateful. How prideful. And yet, my friends, how, how often do we treat God's gifts like that? Where God has given us his his holy and inspired word, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, but we wake up and see our dust-covered Bible and say, yeah, I just, I don't have time for that. Or he's given us the privilege of prayer, but we go through our day as if to, to say, no, I, I, can, I can handle this on my own. I don't need anybody's help. I can just muscle through this thing. The, the Apostle Paul asks a great question in Romans chapter 2. He asks, do you think so lightly of the riches of his kindness? If God gives us a gift, he wants us to use it. He wants us to enjoy it. And he wants us to be blessed through his own kindness. And that's the theme that we see in our passage today in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapters 9 and 10, David shows kindness. He extends the same kindness to different people. And as we will see, one man accepts his gift, and he accepts it with, with humility, he accepts it with gratitude, and he is richly blessed for it. While the other man rejects his gift, 
in, in a rather shameful and even an arrogant way, and he will live to regret it. This passage is not only a reminder like David to, to show kindness, but even more it shows us the best way to respond to the kindness of the king in our own lives. Before we dive in, let's remember what we've been seeing in 2 Samuel. David has been enthroned in Israel and enriched by the Lord. Look back real quick to chapter 8, verse 15. We read a few weeks ago, So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. That's a general statement about his reign, but that general statement will now be followed by two specific examples. One in chapter 9 and one in chapter 10. And David is going to attempt to do what is right by these two individuals. And one will accept it and the other will reject it. Notice the first one in chapter 9 verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now many ancient kings would ask a question that sort of started like that but didn't end like that. They would say, Is there anyone left of my rival's house that I can show him the edge of my sword? That was very common to, to kill your predecessor's entire family. But, but here, David is not an ordinary king. In fact, he says, is there anyone left so I can, I can show them kindness? And for the sake of Jonathan, remember back in 1 Samuel, David and Jonathan were best friends, and they had made this promise to each other years ago. And David said, I, I will look out for your family. And now David wants to make good on that promise. And the key word of the promise which is the key word of these two chapters, is this word, kindness. Now, this is a very, very breathtaking Hebrew word. You might have heard it before. It's the word chesed. It's a word that has so many different meanings, it gets translated almost differently every time it shows up in the Bible. Th this is as rich and as colorful as a rainbow. I imagine a word that includes a red-hot love. And, and it's as endless as a blue sky. And it contains a, the smiling yellow of a happy face. And, and the life-giving prosperity and a, a green warmth of life and energy. And all of it is sort of crammed into one word. And even if you've seen it a hundred times like a rainbow, it catches your eye and makes you smile. That's this word, chesed. It is, a, it is a, a steadfast love, a loyal love, an aggressive kind of bold, generous love. And David says, that's what I want to show. And so he asks the question in verse 1, and so he gets the answer in verses 2 and 3. A man named Ziba is, is brought to him. He was apparently the caretaker of Saul's estate. And he tells David there was a son that Jonathan had, and he is crippled in both his feet. We met him back in chapter 4, verse 4. If you remember, just one line that when Saul died and Jonathan died, his nanny picked him up when he was five years old and dropped him, and as a result, he became disabled. And so David, hearing that he exists, verse 4, so David, so the king said to him, where is he? Now just sit on that question for a second. Where is he? David doesn't wait for this young man to come to him. David goes after him. Th that is this covenant love. It, it takes the initiative. It doesn't wait on others. It, it goes on the hunt. It pursues the person in need. Didn't we sing it earlier? Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. David says, I want to know where he is so that I can go after him. And so we learn in verse 4 that he is in this city called Lodibar, which means something like no word or no message. In other words, the picture in total is that Jonathan's son was basically a nobody from nowhere who had nothing. You, you can't get more destitute than this situation. Now think about it. In the ancient world, kings like to scratch the backs of people who could scratch theirs. This is not the kind of person who's going to do you any favors. He has nothing to offer in return. But David sends for him, and he's brought to David. In verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. 
notice several things in verse 6. First of all, notice David's tenderness. Do you see he calls him by name? By the way, isn't that, isn't it reassuring when somebody really important remembers your name? Like the CEO of the company? And you think, wow, he remembered me. Right? It's, it's a small act of hospitality. And David doesn't see him as this crippled young man who gets no attention. No, he calls him by name Mephibosheth. He treats him like a person. And in those days, a, a young man who was with withered legs like him would often be w- w- probably overlooked. In fact, think about it. How often do people just walk past the kid in the wheelchair? Or they're in the hospital room and they talk to the nurse and the family, but never address the person laying in the bed. David treats him with dignity, with love, with this chesed, and, 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 and dignifies him with care, calling him by name Mephibosheth. And this tenderness is met with meekness. Notice he prostrates himself. He knows he's not worthy. He knows what his grandfather did. He's heard the stories. He knows that by the law of Moses, he's not welcomed in many places having deformed legs. But he knows that, that he shouldn't be here, and so he lays in the dirt and he prostrates himself. My friends, the the only proper way to approach God's king is with humility. And that's what he does. As we said, it was common for kings to find the family tree of their rival and to chop it down. When, When his father died, Mephibosheth was only five years old, and so we can imagine he may have never heard about his father and David's relationship and their covenant. He may know nothing about it, so being summoned to the king's palace, knowing what was common practice, his heart was probably racing, thinking, this is it. I'm about to die. This is what kings do. And so verse 7, David said to him, do not fear. Boy, that's That's kindness. Do not fear. A word of comfort, a word of peace, a word of assurance. You have nothing to be afraid of. My friends, how often do we need to hear that word from our king? Do you ever go to God like Mephibosheth and you are self-conscious about your issues? Hyper aware of your shortcomings, thinking, man, all of my brokenness is on display. I have have lived a, a rotten life, and all of my deformities of my heart and my mind, my hands, my ears, my eyes, they are all broken in ways they should not be. He's gonna see my mess and want nothing to do with me. But my friends, the king says, Don't fear. Because he loves to give grace to the humble. Mephibosheth humbles himself, and David basically says, Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. What is that good news? Verse 7, I will surely show kindness to you. There's that word. For the sake of your father, Jonathan. And he goes on to say, I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my, uh, at my table regularly. If I can sort of tie the sermon together, this is the ultimate Davidic gift card. Unlimited balance, VIP access, and Mephibosheth, I'm going I'm to give this to you. To a man who can do nothing for him, he can't fight a battle, he has no riches, I'm going to give this to you. He, he gives him uh, the, the, the privileged position here. David assure, assures Mephibosheth that he will love him, that he will prosper him, that he will protect him, and that he will feed him. That's what this covenant commitment, that kind of love does. Now, here's what's remarkable about this. It has been probably more than 10 years since David and Jonathan had that conversation. 10 years. How how much has changed in that time? And yet David is taking seriously the promise that he made. And he's going to follow through in practical and permanent ways. Brothers and sisters, this is a good time to ask a question. Do we see and follow through our covenants in that same way? I mean, let's take an obvious one. Think about the covenant of marriage. How often do people say, well, you know, it's been 10 years. We gave it a good try. I mean, she's a different person. I am too. A whole lot has changed. Oh, I know what we said back then in front of the preacher. I know there was some words in exchange and we signed some paper. But, you know, things just aren't the same that they used to be. 
Some changes in life can create uncertainty in some marriages, whether it's health issues or job issues or just family and life. And and sometimes as a spouse, if your spouse begins to think, oh no, this person might leave me. Oh no, this person might look elsewhere. My friend, what they need to hear from their spouse is, do not fear. I will surely show you kindness. I'm not looking anywhere else. I made a commitment to love you, to cherish you, to honor you, and I'm going to follow through till death do us part. That is covenant love. People sometimes say, well, you know, we fell out of love. Actually, I would say you fell out of repentance. Covenant love is to be a permanent and practical, and it is to be aggressive and the way in which it seeks the good of the other person. And David wants to show that to Mephibosheth. And he's shocked by this. Verse 8, he prostrated himself. What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? He knows I don't deserve this. I mean, a dead dog is powerless. A a dead dog is is worthless, right? David says, Mephibosheth says, I have nothing to offer you. And says, David says, that doesn't matter. That's not what I'm interested in. This is not about what I can get out of this. This is because I'm going to love you based on this covenant. That's kindness. That's divine love. A love that doesn't seek anything in return, but lays down itself for the good of another. We won't go through all the details, but in verses 9 and 10, David follows through on the pledge. He makes certain provisions for Mephibosheth of land and possessions, but the author keeps bringing us back, if you notice, to one blessing, one benefit of this relationship. He says it four times that Mephibosheth would eat at David's table this was the most privileged position in the kingdom right this man who had nothing to offer not a man who could who could could lead battles for the military not a man who could forecast the economy but a man who couldn't even walk and david says i want you to sit right here next to me imagine the the privilege imagine the opportunity that he could dine with the king my friends that is kindness i love what eugene peterson said he says that loyal love this love loyal love is not greeting card sentimentality it comes with three square meals a day that's this kind of love it's not flashy it doesn't make it on social media it's probably no headlines but it's a it's a consistent love It's a rock-solid love. And he says, I'm going to show this to you. This man who had been excluded by so many was now welcomed. A man who would have been despised culturally is now being honored. And David shows kindness. In fact, as a result, it says in verse 12, he has a son, he lived in Jerusalem, and he ate at the king's table regularly. Now, why did David do this? Well, we already said he did this. Now, listen, he did this because of the covenant with Jonathan. But there's another reason he did this that the text mentions. Go back and look at verse 3. The king said, look at this question, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show what? The kindness of God. Do you see it? David's kindness to Mephibosheth is is the result of God's kindness to him. David is showing love from the overflow. Because what do we say in chapter 8? God had prospered him. God had enriched him. And David wants to take this, and now he wants to spread it around. My my friends, do, do you see the blessings of God as something to manage or something to share? I need to put them in a closet, in the attic, in the basement, in the attic. I need to put them on a shelf and just sort of keep the dust off of it so i got to kind of hold on to all the blessings of God. David says, no, 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 here, here, come. See what's it, you can have it. Take from this, take from that. God has so richly blessed me, I want to give that to others. What a, what a shocking kind of love. Should this not also be true of us? As I was thinking about this passage, I, I came across a text, in fact, early this morning, where Jesus addresses, listen to what Jesus says. This is, this is crazy. Listen what Jesus says. In Luke chapter 14, don't turn, just listen. He says, and when you give a lunch or a dinner, he's talking to his disciples, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends 
or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors because otherwise they will invite you in return and that'll be your repayment. But when you give a reception or a party, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In other words, love like God loves. Not like the world loves, not like your heart wants to in, it, in, in the flesh, but love in a way that copies God. Because God is a God who has shown all of us kindness and His grace. Do, do you know somebody that you can love this week like that? Maybe it's that odd guy at work that nobody you know, wants to work with. Maybe it's that kid in your class who just really has no friends. That socially awkward girl in the dorm that really nobody, nobody gets to know her. She's just kind of on her own. That's the kind of love that David shows. But it's the kind of love sometimes we're scared of. Because it requires us to risk. It requires us to sacrifice. It requires us to go out on a limb. But my friends, is that not what God did for us in Christ? You see, th this passage, this chapter, I think Paul picks up on the same imagery. If you read Romans chapter 5 carefully, he shows that we are all in the Mephibosheth situation. In Romans chapter 5, he says, quote, that while we were still helpless, while we were yet sinners, and while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. That is the gospel. That is the good news, that God in his rich love for us, he said, where, where are they? And he stepped down into this world and he took on flesh, lived a sinless life and died in our place and rose from the dead. And now he, he holds an eternal banquet, a feast and says, you, you may come. The spirit and the bride says, come. All who are hungry, you may come. If you're thirsty, you can come and receive of the living water without cost. That the invitation is open, Jesus says. I have made the way. The way to Christ is not to pretend that you're strong. It's to admit that you're weak. It's not to clean yourself up first. No, it's to bring him all your dirt and filth. We, we approach him and understand that we lay down before him in humility with our withered prayers and our limping faith and incapable to stand in his presence on our own two feet and we say, God, we need your chesed. We need your kindness. Without your kindness, I have, I have nothing to offer in return. My friends, the joys of this is when we come into this relationship with him like Mephibosheth, we then can dine with him. Which is why we see his word and we shouldn't say, well, I don't have time for that. No, no, no. I mean, imagine David doing, preparing a place for Mephibosheth. I was going to mispronounce it at some point. Whatever his name, right? With a little nameplate, right? Mephibosheth right there. And he's got everything in place. And he does it meal after meal after meal after meal. But Mephibosheth says, I don't, I don't have time for that. What an insult. I can make my own food. No, he, he takes advantage of it and he, he enjoys the fellowship with the king and this relationship as if he was one of his own sons. My friends, do you do that? Do, if God has given you gifts, please receive it with humility. If you've squandered them and wasted them, pushed them off, no, my friends, he's calling you back to his table and he's saying, belly up, you, you can eat. Enjoy it. I have a banquet for you in my kindness. David shows kindness. This man receives it with humility. He dines at the table, and his life would never be the same again. But not everyone receives David's kindness that way, which leads us to chapter 10. Notice chapter 10, verse 1. Now it happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanan his son became king in his place. And watch verse 2. Then David said, I will show up kindness. There it is. To Hanan the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. See, this word ties the two stories together. We don't know exactly when Nahash did this. In fact, last time we saw him, the, the serpent king, Saul had defeated him. 
At some point, he did something nice for David. Probably when he was running from Saul, he hid him out. That's just speculation. Nevertheless, he did something for him, and now he says, I want to return a favor to his son. Now watch these two chapters. Notice how they parallel. Mephibosheth and Hanan are both sons whose father had a covenant with David. Right? So there's this parallel here. But, but notice here, so David not only shows kindness to the Israelite, he also shows it to the Ammonites. Godly kindness knows no bounds. It's not just interested in loving the insiders, it's also interested in loving the outsiders. That's why Scripture says that we should, should, should uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people all people and so david looks outside and says, i'm going to show him chesed i'm going to demonstrate god's love to this pagan so that he he can see this so david sends messengers to console him he basically offers makes the same offer of covenant kindness to him but notice what happens verse three the princes of the ammonites said to hannah and their lord do you think that david's honoring your father because he sent consolers to you has david not sent his servants in order to search the city to spy it out and overthrow it do, do you hear the skepticism do, do you hear the mistrust in them they, they don't believe what David is doing is sincere, even though we know that it is on the surface. And David's actions are going to be misinterpreted. By the way, just fair warning, if you're going to love people with the aggressive, godlike, chesed kind of love, get ready to be misunderstood. Not everybody's going to get it. Your own family might think, why are you doing that? Don't you know who that is? Your friends may say, don't, don't you realize what that person is like? Being kind often means being vulnerable. And David here is, is vulnerable. And rather than taking the gift from David, Hanan basically reaches for a pair of scissors. Notice verse 4, So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips and sent them away. Now, in an honor-shame culture, there are many things done which are symbolic but insulting. And this is one of those cases. They didn't kill them. They didn't hurt them. They did something highly symbolic. In, in, in ancient times, and really still today, but ancient times, a beard is often a symbol of maturity and adulthood. And the Jews were never to cut their beards, according to the Old Testament. So it, it, was, it was that symbol. And, and furthermore, it says that he, they took their robes and they cut them basically just below the belly button. So they shave off half of the symbol of their manhood, and then they quite literally expose their manhood. And they are left in this, humi this humiliating situation. D David's trying to show him kindness. David's trying to console him, and he says, I, I don't have time for this. I don't need your pity. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to depend upon you. I can do this myself. And in arrogance, he sees the gift of the king and says, he rejects it. And so we see there, David tells the men to wait till their beards grow back. And verse 6 is, now when the sons of Ammon saw they had, made, they had become odious to David, they, they caused a big stink, it says, that the sons of Ammon sent and hired the Arameans. So this was not just an act of humiliation, it was an act of war. And they realize we've, we've, we, we, we've, we've created this situation. So they go off and hire, the Ammonites hire some Arameans as mercenaries, like paid professional soldiers, because they think, well, we're going to show this guy David what we're made of. So David, in verse 7, gets the intelligence that something's happening, and he sends his men, verse 8, down with Joab. And that Joab soon finds himself surrounded on both sides. Ammonites on, Ammonites on one side, Arameans on the other side. Now, this is not good. Right? Usually you fight sort of straight across from each other. You kind of size each other and kind of count the numbers. But here, they're going to get attacked on two sides by two flanks. And so Joab does the best that he can. He, he says, well, the Arameans are the paid professional mercenaries. And he takes Israel's green berets and said, you guys go fight them. The rest of us are going to go fight the Ammonites. 
So they split up and kind of turn and say, listen, and he calls out to his brother. He says, look, you do the best you can. I'll do the best I can. If we need to come to your help, if we need it, you, you come to our help and we'll do everything that we can. And in verse 12, he says, be strong and let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. Now, that is an incredible statement of faith, and yet it's a little bit odd when you think about the source. Do you remember Joab? Ugh. Right? Not the best guy in this story so far. Which, by the way, get used to it. In 2 Samuel, bad guys can do good things, and stay tuned, good guys can do really bad things. The story is showing here that Joab, though in this moment, he does actually speak of his faith in God. God will decide what to do. And notice there's that mysterious combination. We're responsible to be courageous and fight, but God is sovereign. Faith is not always knowing the outcome, but it's trusting the God of the outcome. And he says, we're going to look to God, we're going to depend upon God in the end. So they go out to fight, and against all odds, Israel prevails. In fact, if you read the verses there, there's no mention of bloodshed. It doesn't even say anybody dies. They go to her, and they flee, they run. So the Ammonites run off, and the Arameans go packing. Well, remember, the Arameans were the paid mercenaries, right? This was an issue of pride for them. So they say, wait a minute, we can't go down that easy. So they regroup. And in verse 15, the airmen saw that they had been defeated by Israel. They gathered together themselves, and they line up for, for round two. And so they show up again, and this time, verse 17 says, Now when it's told to David, he gathered all Israel. He doesn't just send Joab. He knows, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a lot tougher. And, and the king of Israel was to lead them into battle. So David steps in, and he goes out to battle where the king is supposed to be. And he leads them to fight against the Arameans. And we know that at the end of the chapter, in verse 19, they make peace with him, they come to terms with him, but not until 40,000 people died. 40,000 people died. So do you see what happened? In chapter 10... God's king extends his kindness, but this man rejects it in arrogance and in shame. He doesn't turn to David. He turns against David, and he lives to regret it. They had tens of thousands of funerals that didn't have to happen. The entire uh, mercenary army was wiped out in one fell swoop. And such tragedy, such loss, as David brings God's judgment, God's wrath against them, and they're destroyed. So let's put these two stories together. Do, do, you, see, do you see what I'm talking about? S same king, same kindness, but two very different responses. The man who accepts the king's kindness, watch this, dines at his table, but the, man, the men who reject his kindness, they die at his hand. So my friends, the choice, the fork in the road is pretty clear. When, when the king, when God's king extends his kindness, you can dine or you can die. You can accept it in humility as the gift that it is, or you can say, I, I don't need that. I, I can handle things on my own. I don't need, I, I can do this. I'm okay. And my friends, the outcome you're, you're going to live to see, you're going to regret it. You say, Pastor, I don't think I, I think you're making that up. Well, this Old Testament picture embodies a New Testament reality. So turn with me to Romans chapter 2 for a moment. And I rarely do this, but if I do it, it's important. Romans chapter 2, and I want you to see how Paul says it. Again, New Testament, the Apostle Paul speaking of what God has done in our world in Romans chapter 2, and if you will locate and read along, beginning with verse 4. Look what Paul writes. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, 
not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness, right? So, so Mephibosheth, right, is one who understands the kindness and patience, and it led him to repentance. He humbled himself. But Hanun, because of his stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, verse 7, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for the glory and honor, immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what is theirs? Wrath and indignation. Paul is saying, Every one of us, listen, listen, every one of us is living on borrowed time. The wages of sin is death. And if you're not dead, that is God's chesed to you. It is God's kindness, his forbearance, his patience, his tolerance. And he has given you the, 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 the breath in your lungs, the heart in your chest that beats, family, friends, laughter, food, a job, money, education, so many things. This is, his, this is his abundant super love towards you. And, and on top of all of that, he extends to you the gift of life through his son, the Lord Jesus. While we were helpless, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And to look at that and say, yeah, I can make it on my own. I can face judgment just fine. I'm a pretty good person. I think I can muscle through this. My friends, you might be a big shot here on earth, but on judgment day, we are all hell-bound sinners in need of the mercy of Jesus. And when we reject the gospel again and again and again, listen to me, it's not just cutting up a gift card. To use the language of Hebrews 6, we have, quote, crucified again the Son of God and put him to an open shame. My friends, the kindness of God is right here extended to you. Unbeliever, young person, to, to say you, I'm, you can come to my table. But you, you can't come in, in pride. You have to come in humility, which means what? It means recognizing your position as a sinner. If you won't, if you won't admit your sins, if you, if you won't call what sin is actually sin in the Bible, if you won't do that, then you're not eligible. But to say, no, I recognize that I, I'm not deserving of forgiveness. I'm not deserving of a home in heaven. I'm not deserving of a new heart and new life. But, but Christ, I receive it by faith. And my friends, you can not only receive that, but you can dine with him and come to him and have a permanent relationship with him. And you can, you can sit down and feast with the king of kings every day in prayer and his word where he looks at you like David looked at Mephibosheth and said, son, tell me about your day. How was it? With love and care and compassion, my friends. That's why Jesus came. By the way, th this, this idea that you can dine or you can die, it's picked up one other place in the Bible. I'll, I'll, fi I'll finish with this. One other place in the Bible. If you keep going forward, Revelation 19. You, you may rec don't you turn there. Revelation 19, John writes these words, quote, blessed are those who are invited, listen to this, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? John envisions our future. Right? When this life is over and Christ right, is coming, he envisions a future for us where a royal banquet has been prepared. And those who are in Christ can come and, and sit at the table, the gospel table, knowing that as we sit there, we don't deserve this. And, and our withered legs, if you will, are, are there, our infirmities are there hidden beneath that gospel table. And we sit realizing that we have access to him to eat and drink and enjoy a permanent, eternal, everlasting relationship with God. In a new heavens, in a new earth, no pain, no sorrow, no sin. We can dine with him. But if you keep reading Revelation 19, the very next scene, Jesus gets up from the table and gets on his horse and he goes out to make judgment. And it says he, quote, makes war against those who stand against him. Those who reject him. 
those who say, I, I don't need it, I can do it on my own. He goes out and he tramples them down in his judgment. My friends, you can dine or you can die. And my friends, I am pleading with you to come and dine with Jesus. Come join his family. Come be part of all that he offers. You say, how do I do this? It's very simple. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Like Mephibosheth, humble yourself. The King of Kings has extended the gift of gifts to you and me in the gospel. Will you receive it today? And my friends, if you have received it, think about and remember all that you have and all that you've been given and don't hold it for yourself. Go share it with others. Like David, show that kindness. F find that enemy at work in the neighborhood. You know what you can do? You know what you can do? Buy them a gift card. <laughs> and surprise them with a love and a kindness that they would never expect. That's how God has loved us. And that's how we are to love others.